Uh, so I come to this world from a different direction. I come from evolutionary uh, uh, science, and I wrote my dissertation on the evolution of religious psychology, but I do evolutionary developmental theory, so this is not what you might have read in books by Richard Dawkins. This is a different type of evolutionary scenario. And the type of, of evolutionary uh, um, explanation that I uh, uh, discuss, it's the question is what are the elements in the evo evolutionary toolkit that played a role in mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, a trait, in the construction of a new trait. So in the case of literacy, we have vision, certain motor control, language, memory, um, Someone needed to invent lit literacy thousands of years ago. Someone needed to teach us literacy when we were children or adults. And at the end, we have a physical part of our brain that if we get damage in that part of the brain, then our one hand would not be able to do literacy anymore. But it is, in this case, uh, um, what uh, um, the difference between literate and illiterate people is cultural difference. Doesn't mean it's a cultural trait, because you need the genes for eyes, you need the genes. For, so it's, it's, uh, uh, this approach very goes against the nature-nurture distinction. We think that it's, you, you can't speak about it coherently. But the question is, what were the elements in the evolutionary toolkit that played a role in this complex that I call it here attachment to belief identity, but um, it uh, includes things like the emotion of awe, which I, I discussed also across the hall uh, recently, but uh, also the capacity to undergo sudden conversion, um, to be in the state of fervor, which I gave a talk about a while ago. So the main ingredients that I argue for are different types of love. So this is love uh, um, is a very complex construct, but it's also an emotion, and we'll see. Uh, so you have parent-to-child love, which is probably the most important, but there's child-to-parent, and there's teenager-to-parent, and child-to-parent also changes over time, but teenager-to-parent is a very different type of love. Uh, we have love between siblings, but also extended families, um, and love uh, uh, of, of God, of country, all those things. Um, we also have attachment to family identity, right, which we have in other animals as well, in certain group animals. Um, and it's not attachment to the leader, right, because if the leader of the mole, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the meerkat dies, the group doesn't fall apart. They have a family identity. Now, the other ingredients are uh, well, you have symbolic language. Now, symbolic language gave us a new feeling of knowing, which is the sense of truth, right? Truth as in a match between words and reality. That sense of truth, that, that meaning, but there's also a sense that something is true, and that needed to interact with all these other types of love and to give us this new construct. And this construct takes from each one of these types of uh, things and then there's additional elements, you know, music and other other stuff. All right, so this is a little background, uh, a little more background. Um, so I say that there's a a, a a a connection between love as an emotion, right? Love is a bunch of things, but it's also just an emotion, and awe, right? So awe is the the religious psychology. A, a version of this emotion that in a family psychology would be love. We have falling in love, which can happen suddenly and can happen involuntarily, right? So you can, I, so you can find a baby on your doorstep and you'll have an involuntarily fall in love with that baby. Um, and that, I think, is related to conversion or also being born again. So that's sort of a conversion to something you already sort of are a part of. Limerence, so being in love, this is in the romantic sense. I think that this, um, and this is an event, this is an emotion, this is a state that you can be in for months or weeks or years. You can push it to quite a few years probably, but then it goes away. 
and that is related to the psychological state of fervor, right? So this needs to graduate to love from limerence. Um, but fervor, I think, is a, the corresponding emotional or psychological state that you can be in. But that's what I gave a whole talk about. So, um, and then family identity is what I call a belief identity, but that's a con, uh, um, is, is uh, uh, more complicated. So awe is to the state of fervor, like love, the emotion, is to the psychological state of limerence or infatuation, as I call it here. Okay. Uh, and love experiences are catalysts to falling in love. And similarly, awe experiences are catalysts to a conversion or being born again. And we'll see there can be other uh, um, outcomes of awe experiences. But I need to give you all this talk about awe before I talk about what causes awe. And I'll just say that um, uh, what the, there's many similarities between awe and these other types of love. But what is very unsimilar is the causes, is the triggers. And that sort of makes sense, because what triggers romantic love and what triggers uh, uh, parental love, for example, are very, very different also. So in our evolution, when new types of love were added, and we started with parent to child and child to parent, which are very, very unsymmetric, but when we added new types of love, the triggers were completely different. So romantic, which clearly come later, right? Most mammals don't have um, uh, romantic love. Uh, uh, then that got triggered in a very different way. So when we get this new comer this, in this family variety of different types of love we can have, it shouldn't surprise us too much that that too would have very different triggers and causes, and that's what... I'm talking about here. So, yeah, so different triggers. Now, um, one of the conclusions that, that I come from all of this, and, and this might be uh, um, not uh, at the center of the subject of this talk, but I think it's important to talk about in this context, is that at the end, I mean, so when you fall in love, let's say, romantically, Today, we think of it as you forming a connection with someone else. In the past, and in the norm over human history, is that you create a whole lot of relationships. You get, usually, the woman would be given to another family. She would be married to a person. She would fall in love romantically, hopefully, with the groom. But she would need to create a child-to-parent love relationship with the parents, with the patriarch, the matriarch parent to child love to maybe other children that her husband has or maybe nephews or so all you, you get a whole set of family relationships just by falling in love romantically and I think that when people join a cult they many times create a whole lot of attachment relationships with all sorts of people so the cult leader might be a child to parent relationship that a person might have the relationship with other members might be the relationship that people have with siblings but most importantly the relationship to the cult can very many times resemble a parent to child so people treat the cult as a child of theirs that they need to nourish that they need to make sure that they they flourish that they do well that they are healthy and this, the type of giving that we see that cult members give to their cult is not the kind you see children give to parents. It's the kind you see parents give to children, which is, of course, the much stronger one. Um, so, um, well, let, let me, before, before we get to this, I'll say uh, a few more. Um, no, maybe I'll, I'll say it later. So. Let's now give an example of uh, uh, how to induce awe. So, anybody want to read? Bill, read. What if you slept? What if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dreams you went to heaven? And there was a strange and beautiful flower. And what if when you awoke, you had that flower in your hand? 
Okay, so this is a short poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which was also mentioned earlier today in another context. Um, and the answer, what then, of course, is, you know, that means I need to pray towards Mecca five times a day. Obviously, <laughs> duh. You know, if this happened to you, you know that Islam is correct, right? Or that Christianity is correct, or that Buddhism, right? So what we have here is we have a, a, an experience which is judged by the person to be sufficiently anomalous. And because of that, it induces the emotion of awe. The emotion of awe then makes you feel that things are really real. Now, what is it that you feel is really real? We're going to, you know, is it Christianity? Is it Islam? How are we going to tell? Well, we'll get to that in a second. So, if we uh, uh, talk about, there's a, a story in the Christian Bible about Jesus walking on the water, and this is the only example of a miracle being misinterpreted as to what it means. So, normally, in the, the you know, the, the, the Red Sea parts, and people know exactly what it means. In this case, the people on the boat, when they see Jesus walking on the water, they think that they're seeing a ghost. So they think that the miracle proves that ghosts exist, which, why wouldn't it, right? But then when Jesus makes it onto the, to, to, to the boat, and says, actually, it doesn't prove that ghosts exist. It proves that I am Jesus. I am him or whatever it is he says. Um, but it is a case that in, shows that actually there is no connection. You know, the fact that, that, that he is the son of God or that ghosts exist or that we live in the matrix or that aliens have landed, none of those are related to the unusual buoyancy of Jesus, right? Um, <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. I'm sorry. If, but um, so... What we have is an established experience that leads to a set of beliefs being proven. Now, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's more complicated than that. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the basic schema. And so here's a quote by Mr. William James from 1902, and he says that mystical experiences have a noetic quality. Now, the word noetic is, uh, uh, means relating to knowledge. And it says, although so similar to states of feeling, mystical states seem to those who experience them to be also states of knowledge. They are illuminations, revelations full of significance and importance, and as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority for aftertime. Okay? Now, if we change mystical experiences, and th the word awe actually only became very popular since the 90s. Before that, they used sublime and all sorts of other terms. But... If we change this to thinking about the experience of becoming a parent, right, having a baby and that changing our lives, creating a lifelong commitment, coming with rose-colored glasses, coming with a sensitivity to criticism, all those things, we also say that this, those who experience that experience feel like it's a state of knowledge. Now, in this case, it's the knowledge that you need to take care of the baby because <laughs> you better take care of the baby. Um, but they're full of significance and importance, and they carry with them a curious authority for after time. Uh, I'm sorry, who is he? William James. He's the father of modern psychology. He's, uh, you know. And, and is it important the authority for after time? I don't want to get stuck in it, but is it important? Yeah, that this effect, this mystical experience can affect you for years, decades, to the rest of your life, you know, but also having a baby can affect you for the rest of your life. Um, now, so expectations make all the difference in how you interpret the experience. <laughs> uh, now, so let's say you woke up with a dream flower and the night before you watched the movie The Matrix. Then you might say, oh, this proves to us that you live in a simulation, right? I mean, I woke, I dreamt of the flower, and then I woke with it. But if you watched The Nightmare on Elm Street, you might, <laughs> you might be a little worried that now you might, you might get murdered in your dream, and this might actually happen. So, as you can see, expectations, assumptions, context, how you interpret the, the 
everything, the social context, the psychological context, all of them are important. And we can see in this case uh, an inexplicable event can prove things are unrelated, but you know who this guy, this is Uri Geller. This is a famous charlatan from the 70s. <laughs> and who could bend spoons, and if you want, at the end of the show, I can bend the spoon as well, but um, <laughs> I've done that before, so I won't do it now, but at the end, if you want me to, it's, I've heard gasps, people, <laughs> even though it's obviously a lie. Um, and yet he was called to solve the, you know, there was a missing jet, and they're like, well, let's ask Uri Geller, he can bend a spoon. <laughs> Maybe he would know where the jet is, right? <laughs> um, okay, so now we come to this construct that I call the default noetic conclusion or realization, or, and that uh, um, is, is, helps explain how awe is being used in recruitment. Um, so let's say you take four atheists from the ICSA conference. And uh, let's say I would have a bowl of sugar here, and I would drop the bowl of sugar, and on the floor, in the sugar that fell, the word truth would be spelled out. So a miracle happened. One of them might conclude that Islam is correct, one of them might become an, a Jew, and one of them might conclude that but Buddhism or, or something. One of them might think, where's the magnets underneath? That's not really sugar, right? <laughs> And someone might worry, you know, <laughs> who's going to clean this up. But um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what uh, the default noetic conclusion is, is what will you conclude if you had a, a, a sudden awe experience, a strong awe experience? So you can have an atheist, that I'm an atheist, but if I have a strong awe experience, Mahayana Buddhism it is. Someone else, they're an atheist, or they're, uh, uh, but if they would have a strong awe experience, another thing would be proved. Now, this, what will be proved, that's not that hard to change. So to change your mind, to change your faith, to undergo con conversion, that's hard, that's complicated. Let's see what my, um, but the, the, what you will conclude if you have an awe experience, that's actually not that hard. So let's say I travel to India and I'm at an ashram and in this ashram, everybody believes that the guru is God. I don't believe that guru is God, but because of the social context and because I'm told about it, if I now have an awe experience, that's what I would conclude. Now, it could be that Catholicism would be concluded normally. Regular everyday experience, I would, you know, awe experience at home, Catholicism it is. But because of this context, I'm in the ashram, now my default conclusion would be that the guru is God. And so if you're invited to do a long-term, you know, few hours meditation where you will have hallucinations and you don't know to expect them and you interpret them as being sufficiently anomalous, then you can uh, um, uh, uh, in, induce a, a, an awe experience which will prove to the person that the guru is God and that is, uh, uh, can be a very powerful way to induce a conversion and get people to get involved. Okay, so now people who saw me an hour ago across the hall saw me talk about temporal lobe epileptics, so I won't repeat this, but the temporal lobe, well, temporal lobe epileptics, they are people who feel awe all the time or very, very frequently. They're fascinating, super interesting, and we can learn a lot about how it feels like and what the effects are and, and everything from uh, temporal lobe epileptics. But let me continue. So these are two books. This one came out last year. This one came out earlier this year. I didn't like them that much, but, you know, I don't want to, um, you know, what, what can I say? Um, and 
the, according to Mr. Keltner and Haidt, they say they propose that prototypical awe involves challenge or to or negation of mental structures when they fail to make sense of an experience of something vast. So they say two things need to happen. You need to have a vast experience and you need to not know how to understand it. But I don't think that that's true and I can, I can argue why they make this mistake. Um, and we'll see. So we need to take a step back and talk about emotions. Uh, I only have 10 more minutes, so I'm gonna rush through a lot of this and come talk to me. I can give you the whole thing later. Um, so <clears throat> there is the, the, William James is actually the father of the physiological theory of emotion, that an emotion is its physiological experience, also related to Darwin, that each emotion has a facial expression, but that is, it's one aspect of emotions, and that is one school. Uh, the other school, which I think is more relevant in this context, is the neo-Stoic view where an emotion is an evaluation. So I'll just give you, this is the, the uh, a story about the, the empty boat. I don't know if you heard it. It's uh, Eastern philosophy, Xiang uh, Chi, I think. Um, and he tells a story of, of meditating, he's sitting on a boat on a lake, he's meditating, he gets hit by another boat, he gets super pissed off at that guy in the other boat, he's like, what is he not looking? He gets angry, he gets fully angry, gets, where is that asshole? Gets up and then sees the other boat is empty. He's like, oh, well, I guess, and his anger disappears <laughs> because there's no Bundy to be angry about, it's an empty boat that hit him. So it shows you how how you evaluate the situation really, really can affect how the emotion you feel. Um, so, but, well, so what we have, we have the outside world and the world view and expectations. So this could correspond to the sudden settings that were talked about in the last lecture. But, so, and, and then you have a judgment and then you have the emotion. So if the judgment is that something is sufficiently anomalous, then you, the emotion would be awe. But what caused it to be judged as sufficiently anomalous can come from the outside world. For example, something weird happened, you know, a lightning or, as I said, a miracle happened, something unexpected. Or it can come because we believe that a double rainbow can't exist. So when you see it, <laughs> you judge it as to be anomalous and you are blown away, even though every... every uh, rainbow is a double rainbow. Um, but uh, uh, d d <laughs> there's, um, now this is, the, both of these schools of emotion, these are the psychology, psychological emotions. There's a whole other school which is the social emotions and what causes social emotions and in cultic situations, social emotions, I think, are particularly important because you can have groups where everybody is the same. So in many, many ways, including what is called the emotional regime, knowing which emotion is appropriate in which way. And so in cults, especially the social manipulation and determination of what emotions you feel and what triggers what emotions is particularly important. But I'll, maybe I'll talk about that next year because that's a whole complete different lecture. That it's all. It's yeah. Oh yeah. I'll just replug what was plugged and uh, let's hope for the best. Okay. So. Uh, now, what about causation? I'm talking about the causes of awe, and causation philosophically is a big minefield. Nobody knows what causation is. It's too, solely hard to, and I'm going to talk about some causes of awe, even though I won't, I got five minutes, so. Um, the, there's always other sub-causes, so if you're 15 years old, it's n that's not what caused the awe, but it makes it a lot easier to cause awe when you're 15 years old. Um, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, you're more likely to feel awe. 
Uh, if you're in the habit of feeling awe, you're more likely to feel awe. So there's all other sub-causes. So I, I, when I'm going to talk about causes of awe, and um, so awe, it relates to the, the, the feelings of knowing. Let's see, what do I have? Um, and that, that's based on a book I recommended across the hall um, by, by on being certain. And the, the feeling of awe feels like something is really real, like you knew something. Um, and this is the feelings of knowing model, but I don't. This is how the feelings of knowing manipulate us, and they manipulate us, I'll just say. And you just look at it, and um, it's possible, like. That the context is an assumption. Uh, how the, the default noeticalization, but this happens to all the feelings of knowing, even familiarity. If you look at them close enough at the, at the scale of less than half a second, we're all manipulated by them. They're all, they're, they're very weird constructs, the feelings of knowing. So it's very important. You can get the argument from strangers, which I mentioned earlier, something is strange, therefore something that's unrelated. And it feels natural. You know, you can't explain the evolution of the eye. Therefore, it proves that God created the world in six days, right? I mean, that, that, that kind of, um, and yet it feels normal. So, when it comes to emotion in general, also, the feelings of knowing determine whether you think it's going to be real or whether it's going to be something you can disregard. So, you can be afraid in a movie theater. It's not the same as being afraid in real life. And you can see a magician bend a spoon, knowing that that's a lie, or you can see a charlatan bend a spoon, thinking that you just experienced the proof that humans have superpowers. But you, they don't. Okay, so um, let me talk about just the different effects of awe uh, very quickly, so you can just have a good time. Um, <laughs> and it affects you in a certain way. Um, you can also become born again, you can undergo conversion, you can also retroactively, like when I was five, I had an awe experience, I didn't know to, how to explain it. But now that I joined Scientology, I know that that was, so you can retroactively use an awe experience to prove something to yourself. Um, uh, and then there's specific outcomes, I'll just uh, uh, say here that you, you, you get a package of beliefs, you don't get beliefs. And the reason why it's a package is because you can, they can be unknown. You might not, you can believe that whatever's in the Quran is true, but you don't know what's in the Quran, right? That's not how regular beliefs work. You can also ignore the most central things that you believe in. I mean, this might sound like fiction, but you can be a Christian and not give all your money to the poor. I know, how can that be? You know, if you strike a Christian, they might not turn the other cheek. I know it's the central belief of, you know, that's what we know about Christians, right? And yet, <laughs> and there can be with your conversion, all sorts of beliefs that are in addition to the belief. So it might come with homophobia or all sorts of stuff. So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> we got all sorts of, uh, and yeah, this is how it feels. <laughs> and because we got, we got a, a, a minute left. So you got, we got seizures and that's the direct way to get off. <laughs> you know, why go, why beat around the bush where you can just zap the brain? Um, so there's, uh, epilepsy, um, and there's, you know, uh, being, uh, uh, and then there's emotional contagion and neur mirror neurons. And I'll just uh, uh, say that sometimes if, if the, the cult leader feels very, a lot of awe, especially if they're an epileptic like Mr. Hubbard and maybe him and absolutely her, um, <laughs> then they can look you in the eye and because of mirror neurons and emotional contagion, you can feel that both you're being understood, they understand you, that you, you get the contagion, you feel the awe yourself, and you can say, after that guru stared into my eyes, I knew I will follow them forever. 
because the emotion can be so effective. So um, a lot more to say about many things, uh, miracles, but we're, <laughs> we're out of time. I'm just going <laughs> to drugs, deprivations, <laughs> stress reduction. We got falling in love. Uh, and then impressive anomalies. Oh my God, I, I, I was very optimistic as to how much celebrities, you know, if Mick Jagger walked in, we would all feel awe. Uh, uh, vastness, ancientness, and, uh, and thank you. So.